Good afternoon. It's Thursday the 10th of May 2018, a little bit after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Can we just say welcome to the BBC journalists that we know follow us on a daily basis? I believe some of you are quite senior, so welcome to the UK Column. Hopefully you will learn a few things. And we'd also like to say thank you very much to the mainstream press journalists who we now know tune in to the UK column, not necessarily every day, but when they can, depending on their schedule. So we're going to say welcome to you as well. And we're absolutely delighted that uh, UK Columns News is now spreading into that wider domain. Uh, we're going to begin today with the separation of powers, Brian. Uh, and uh, it's just amazing in one single day how many press releases have been released uh, from the government undermining the separation of powers. Uh, and we're going to start off with uh, the tech sector uh, because the tech sector has been invited uh, to uh, get involved in the grand challenges, the four grand challenges. Um, this is the Cabinet Office driving forward with uh, merging the private sector tech companies with government policy. Uh, and as we see, see in a moment, uh, we're, going to see, we're going to talk about farming. We're also going to talk about policing. Uh, so getting started with the tech agenda, they're launching competitions for tech firms to develop solutions to tackle the major social challenges of our modern age. Uh, and so what we have here is tech companies competing for tax dollars in order to drive forward government policy. Uh, they're obliged to unquestioningly press forward and to hell with the consequences sort of thing is what's going on here. Uh, Minister for Implementation, Oliver Dowden, uh, is announcing the uh, first round of competitions for tech specialists to tackle social challenges at the government flagship digital conference, which is called Sprint 18. Uh, and uh, these uh, competitions will be delivered using £20 million of government GovTech fund, uh, which is launched by the Prime Minister uh, at the end of last year. Uh, now, what are the grand challenges? Well, they're artificial intelligence, uh, mobility, which is, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles and so on, uh, clean growth and an ageing society. So we're going to deal with uh, the ageing population. I'm not quite sure. Uh, we're going to deal with the aging population. We're going to remove them, Mike. Is, right. Uh, what the government is planning to do, and indeed is doing it already. They're just going to get more efficient at doing it. Okay. So the first of these competitions is going to open on Monday, the fourteenth of May. Uh, it runs for six weeks. The remaining comp competitions will be launched in subsequent months. Uh, and tech firms bidding to fund uh, to the fund will have uh, free reign to uh, create truly innovative fixes. Uh, and they're going to be awarded uh, money and so on. So uh, a bunch of bungs for uh, fulfilling government policy here. Uh, what did uh, Oliver Dowden say? He said the GovTech fund encourages firms to find innovative ways to fix the big social problems we all face. So I'm feeling a lot better uh, for that. Uh, are you, Mike? I wonder whether you could just jump back to the previous slide. I don't know whether our viewers can see it, but I did happen to notice that if you analyse the ageing society one there, you've got the elderly person and you can almost de detect the sort of angst, even though you're behind them, but you're then looking at a superior individual, much late younger lady who's clearly professionally trained. And I think she's looking at scans of brains. Yes. Um, so that's a pretty cheerful a uh, little glimpse into the future. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But it doesn't stop there because then it moves on to uh, farming with the future farming consultation. Uh, and what amused me slightly about this press release was the image that they chose to represent it, as you can see on screen there, doesn't have much farming going on. Right. And that really gives us a clue as to well, what's going on here. Right. Well, but just also add, Mike, that, of course, the mistake is they put a tree in it and we know that the trees are going to be cut down in order to help the, vi the 5G programme. Yeah, but in fairness, that's only in the cities. In the okay. countryside, we're going to be replacing <laughs> farmland with lots of trees, but we'll come on to that in a second. Uh, so basically, uh, 40, 44,000 responses have been received by the government. Uh, for the uh, who were investigating or running a consultation on the future for food farming and the environment uh, once we leave the EU. Uh, 20,000 responses in the last week, uh, and these were submitted to the Health and Harmony consultation, uh, which closed on the 8th of May. Uh, farmers, food producers, and environmentalists sharing their views, uh, but they were sharing their views with DEFRA uh, alongside groups, including the National Trust, the National Farmers Union and the Eden Project. So these groups 
as we have made many, this point has been made many times, these groups not holding government to account anymore. Uh, in fact, they're, uh, they're, there to, they're there to be in partnership with government and so on. Uh, so uh, this consul consultation included proposals to redirect payments under the Common Agricultural Policy, uh, which are based on the amount of land farmed, to a new system of paying farmers public money for what Michael Gove in the past has described as public goods, uh, which basically involves uh, converting farmland over to uh, other uses. And uh, the government cited uh, the World Wildlife Fund in this particular uh, poll, which they say found that 91% of the UK public wants to see farmers pay to protect nature. So what we're seeing is this combination of uh, government and NGOs like the National Trust and unions like the National Farmers Union and organisations like the Eden Product pr Project uh, getting together to promote Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 uh, and to remove uh, farmland from use uh, for farming and producing food. food and uh, reverted to rewilding and so on. And, and you mentioned the trees. We've got to remember, of course, that uh, while the trees are being cut down in our cities, uh, the government has uh, announced six months ago or so uh, the new Great Forest, uh, which is going to basically uh, reach from the west coast of Lancashire across the east coast of Yorkshire. Uh, and, uh, well, of course, we don't need to worry about trees being cut down in cities because all that farmland is going to be converted over to, uh, to growing trees. And certainly not growing food. Okay. And can I, can I just yes. interject there, Mike? I'm fascinated that the Eden Project should be involved in this because let's remember what the Eden Project was. It was a tourist attraction in an abandoned quarry in Cornwall where eventually millions of government money goes in to build what was quite a spectacular um, giant greenhouse for visitors for Cornwall, but it was a tourist attraction. Uh, but then Common Purpose got involved. Common Purpose, the political charity, started to train senior members of that team. And later we had a gentleman, his name escapes me, but I believe he was a Rothschild banker, joined the board. And at that stage, Eden Project changed from being a tourist attraction to one of these uh, quasi-government advisory bodies. Well, I have to say, I've been there once, Brian, and it is one of the most anti-human organisations uh, that I've seen. Uh, some of the... Uh, artwork, some of the sculptures, um, really designed to, to uh, make you feel pretty p bad to be a human being. Um, so I, I don't like it very much. But anyway, we move on because uh, separation of powers uh, also goes to anti uh, counter-terrorism policing uh, under the UK Protect uh, scheme, step change called action. So what's going on here? Uh, well, this is important information, apparently, and a call to stakeholders within the business community to par participate in the National Counterterrorism Step Change Program. Uh, the Counterterrorism uh, Security Office has issued a call for action for policing the private sector and government to support the integrated delivery of 25 projects intended to enhance the protective security of the United Kingdom. These projects have been defined through tripartite working groups established through the Step Change Conferences uh, and are a combination of new activity and works in progress that the working groups wish to develop and contribute to. And they say that following the terrorist attacks in London and Manchester in 2017, it was widely recognised uh, that there had to be significant shift in delivery of protective security across the UK, and this could only be achieved through a tripartite approach of government, police and private sector. Uh, there are five work streams uh, as shown below. I'll come on to those in a second. 25 individual projects across the five work streams. The five work stream streams are entitled Crowded Places, Security and Resilience, Transport, Cyber, Travel and Tourism. Right. The point is this is already happening uh, as uh, various uh, other media outlets have been pointing out and we have as well. Uh, this is uh, Evolve Politics saying Tory to get, Tories to give private firms like G4S and Circo powers to arrest people in shocking £290 million pound privatisation deal. But look, the point here is if we have the police and private security working closely together like this, let's just uh, take one example uh, of anti-fracking protests that we've seen yeah. in, in recent months, uh, where we've seen uh, fracking anti-fracking protesters being treated extremely badly by the police at the protest sites. But equally, uh, we have seen incidences of private security firms at the protest sites assaulting the protesters. Uh, now, if we then have the situation where there is no separation of powers uh, and police and the private sector are working together, um, then 
Uh, what are the opportunities that for uh, the police to ignore assaults by uh, private security personnel uh, on protesters? Uh, and you can take that uh, analogy out to a whole range of different uh, scenarios. So yeah. uh, this is a pretty dangerous situation and uh, one that we shouldn't be uh, permitting. We shouldn't be permitting it. Of course, one of the key areas we can see this collaboration with the police going on so that uh, inve um, police investigation gets dropped is in child protection because the police are sitting on the safeguarding boards that are failing or covering up a blind eye to the child abuse. So the moment we draw the police into these groups, of course, separation of powers is gone and um, the police not doing their job. Mm. City centre management companies, of course, are the other ones to watch because they're employing private security agents that are patrolling as if they were quasi police inside mm. city centres. So dangerous stuff. Uh, well, um, let's have a look at this. Um, we were given a little bit of a heads up. Bye bye Bobbies was the comment made to us. And uh, what we were told was that uh, there's going to be big changes to the police training co college at, at uh, Hendon and uh, traditional uh, training in which much of it was to put the young trainee uh, bobbies through role play so that they had to deal with people who were potentially aggressive or were drunk or other forms of um, uh, crime investigation where they learnt from experienced officers and of course the young bobbies also put out um, on the beat with more exper experienced officers to learn all that is going to change and what we were told is that the future is going to be that you cannot be a police constable unless you've got a degree. And those degrees are going to be learnt by distance learning via the internet. So this is a substantial change to British policing. Now we've started to follow a little bit of this up just in the last couple of days. And uh, if you go through uh, and have a look at MACE, uh, this company is boasting that it's joined forces with the Met in order to effectively transform the policing college at Hendon. Uh, so what sort of thing are they talking about? Well, interestingly, the language is just fascinating, Mike, because the word spiritual is crops up several times. So you've, we know it's going to be a sort of degree training, but this word spiritual, I don't know what sort of spiritual it is or why a corporation, a corporate company should be using it, but it's there. Uh, let's have a look at this bit. Um, what does it say? Well, it says Mace had to understand the flagship project's political requirements. So that's a nice start for us. We know where it came from and work closely with the various metropolitan police departments and the mayor's office uh, for policing and crime. Maintaining our long and successful working relationship was extremely important to us as we worked in close collaboration. There it is, Mike. There's your collaboration to deliver this first class 21st century building that will allow the Met to continue to be one of the world's leading police forces. And that was a statement by Andrew Wilson, the project director of MACE. MACE is a two billion pound uh, company, construction company. Uh, what have we got here? Well, the vision was that by 2020, all staff should be able to work from where they need to in an environment that is fully connected and have technology that enables full connectivity of data information and people so that fits with the fact that you're going to put a lot of this training online that all seems to work quite well uh, so let's bring in the mayor's office of policing and crime and if people haven't been paying attention to this remember it's the mayor of london an individual mm. that is now in control of policing in in uh, london and uh, let's bring in the met police there's the full picture um, so how can we how can we reinforce this? Well, if you come through to the mayor's office, uh, we've got this very nice lady, Claire Waxman. She says, have you been a victim of crime? Do you have a view on how su support for victims in London should be provided? Uh, nothing about tracking the criminals down, Mike. We're going to support the victims. Uh, but she's conducting a survey to inform her review of victim support services in London. Uh, so we thought our viewers and listeners might to get, like to get onto that page and communicate with this lady and explain to her it would be a good start to help victims if the police actually did their jobs of investigating crimes. Uh, but we've got another page here. This is um, uh, the Victims Commissioner. So 
Now she's hopped across to the different role, uh, victims commissioner. Um, being a victim of crime will know someone who has, and then she's pushing the survey again. So it says London Victims Commissioner Claire Waxman works to, quote, improve the experience of victims of crime. I, I found that an astonishing statement. Mm -hmm. uh, to it, you're a victim of crime. We want to improve your experience. Mm -hmm. What? As a, from the crime itself or what? Hard to say. Hard to say. Uh, OK, well, let's get in a bit deeper uh, to this lady. Here she is. Um, Claire has been a prominent and long-standing champion for victims' right, motivated by her own experience of the justice process as a victim of crime over a 12-year period when she was targeted by a fixated stalker. So I'm not sure how you get from that position to becoming the victim's commissioner, but OK, we accept that she got in and got the job. So she's ensuring compliance with the victim's code of practice, the minimum standards of service a victim of crime can expect. Well, investigation of the crime might be one of those. Bringing the victim voice to the table, leading work to increase awareness of and access to support services, helping to refresh the London Violence Against Women and Girls strategy. And there's contact details there, including a phone number and an email address. So if any of our viewers and listeners today would like to make an opinion felt, obviously we always say polite and reasonable, I put one in this morning. I thought I'd just uh, get in on the Twitter page. I said, if you're seriously seeking to help child victims of crime, then you should fully investigate the cover up of major crimes such as child abuse by those within Westminster, the Met, local authorities, charities, NGOs, and start protecting the whistleblowers. And I gave a link through to John Wedger. So hopefully um, that will stay on her web page and help inform other people. Uh, that are seeking justice. Uh, now, the uh, NHS conference in Nottingham, we are getting very close indeed. I'm going to thank all of you that have now bought tickets. We're still encouraging more people to come. The hall can take a large number of people. We know that many people are going to pay on the door. Thank you for coming, but we're going to say if you are going to come and pay on the door, Please be there in good time because uh, we have to get people through uh, into the main hall. Doors will be open at nine, but the event will be starting at 10 sharp. Uh, if you're not decided yet, you've got a couple of days to go. We would encourage you to come. This is very important. And of course, pass the word, bring a friend. And as we said yesterday, can anyone help with a very deserving person who needs help to get to this event and they're coming from the Bognor Regis area so if you're traveling from somewhere fairly close and possibly they could get a lift to you uh, would you get in touch with the UK column and uh, we'll see what we can do to help um, okay things ramping up uh, around Israel and Syria uh, and uh, well RT pointing out today that uh, well they were covering the uh, Russian military and defense briefing this morning uh, 28 Israeli jets fired about 60 rockets in overnight strikes on Syria. And they're saying the 28 Israeli aircraft fired those rockets in a massive overnight strike in Syria, according to the Russian Defense Ministry. A total of 70 projectiles, including 60 air-to-surface rockets and more than 10 surface-to-surface -surface missiles, hit Iranian military targets and Syrian air defense systems near Damascus and in the south of the country on Thursday morning. Uh, and uh, 28 Israeli F-15s and F-16s involved in the attack. Uh, Syrian air defense system shot down more than half of the rockets as they repelled the Israeli attack. Um, Israel then uh, complained bitterly because what appears to hap have happened is that there's been a counterattack. Uh, but as uh, Fars is reporting here, uh, according to Israeli media, uh, only 20% of the rockets fired from Syria uh, were intercepted by the uh, Israeli air defense systems uh, and they quote uh, Israeli Defense Forces spokesman Le uh, Lieutenant John, uh, sorry, Lieutenant General, uh, try that again, Lieut Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan uh, Conricus, uh, who said that several but not all of the rockets were intercepted uh, by Israeli defenses uh, and he said that, uh, that they had been using the Iron Dome missile defense system. Uh, which brought down four of the rockets. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Uh, Vanessa Bailey gives a list of the uh, Israeli military targets or the, the targets, the Israel, uh, the targets in the Golan Heights that were attacked. Uh, and uh, there was a major military center for technical and electronic surveillance, for example, uh, the headquarters of what's called Image Collection Unit 9900, uh, a major military center for wiretapping networks and so on. There's, there's 10, 10 of them. Uh, and uh, but what did Israel do? They suggested that it was uh, Iranian forces that had uh, shot back at them, uh, attacking these 10 locations. Uh, but that doesn't seem to have been the case because the uh, Syrian Arab army pushed out this statement today, uh, basically uh, listing the, the uh, Israeli attacks that resulted in this retaliation from the Syrian army. And they make it quite clear that Syrian military responded by firing a barrage of missiles at Zionist military points inside the occupied Golan Heights. Now, this is the important point here, and it's a point made very clearly by Peter Ford this morning, uh, because he said the Syrian response was carefully calibrated. No attacks on Israeli territory, only on Syrian territory of occupied Golan. Uh, and he said, nevertheless, a threshold has been crossed. The 20 Syrian missiles fired in, Syria, in Israel's direction represent the biggest Syrian military strike against Israel in more than five decades. Uh, and so he's absolutely right, and it must be uh, cause for concern that, this, that Israel is attempting to ramp this up in this way, Brian. It's just astonishing, Mike. It, Israel, um, on one hand, says Israel, of course, fearful of being denied the right to exist. Um, but on every way we turn, is, Israel is aggressive, uses massive force to respond to incidents does not seem to want to have any dialogue with these people, does not want to accept that other countries also have the right to exist. So I, I just find the Israeli action, is, it's as though they want to pro provoke a major uh, war in the, in the Middle East. Well, I get the feeling they think they've got Trump eating out of the, out of the palms of their hands uh, and uh, that no matter what they do at this point, they're going to they're gonna have their backs covered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we're mentioning Trump, let's uh, bring in Nigel Farage because he's here in the Express. Iran nuclear deal is globalist policy. Farage warns EU are going to be very disappointed. I found this an absolutely astonishing article. We'll see why in a moment. Uh, but what he's really doing is taking what Nigel Farage is doing is taking the globalist policy, which we we know is for aggressive regime change in Iran and certainly in Syria. And he is spinning it into the fact that this is actually EU appeasement. So globalist policy, according to Nigel Farage, is the EU appeasement. Um, what's this man up to? Well, it just seems to me that he's abandoned anything to do with problems in UK. He's not interested in this. What is he, informal Trump spin doctor? Mm. Um, so let's have a look at uh, what he said in this, uh, we was quoted as saying in this article, Boris Johnson has been in Washington for the last couple of days and he's not there independently representing the UK. This is European Union policy, a globalist policy that we should appease Iran, get rid of sanctions and in return for this, they're not going to promise us that they will not develop their nuclear program. So Farage not interested in the demise of the UK, the fact the UK is, is being reduced to rubble at the moment itself. He's here pontificating, but this is very clever spin because the, the globalist agenda, of course, is to completely um, get that regime change in, in, in Iran and to break down Iran in the same way that uh, they've done it in Iraq and they were close to doing it in Syria. Um, Nigel Farage trying to distract people. And then he said this, and it just made me laugh. I have to say, I'm personally very skeptical about the European Union position on this. Skeptical. But this is the man who says that the EU was untrustworthy, effectively said that they were corrupt in lots of ways, behaving like the mafia. But on this subject, he's a little bit skeptical. <laughs> OK, perhaps somebody can explain whether this man has a very cunning plan. Um, but what I'm happy to say is, of course, that he's utterly deserted the UK at just the time the UK is under massive attack um, in terms of politics, constitution, law and order, uh, employment and a few other things. Mm. OK, uh, reminder that uh, Media on Trial has found a new venue for the event in Leeds uh, following the withdrawal of Leeds City Museum as a venue 
uh, and uh, details of that will be uh, sent to ticket holders in due course. Uh, but if you would like a ticket for that, there are still tickets available uh, at mediaontrial.uk. Uh, Media on Trial, I think, deserves support uh, because uh, of the attacks that they've been under, uh, sustained attacks for the last uh, two or three months from the mainstream media. Uh, and uh, so get along to that if you possibly can. OK, and uh, now this one was very interesting article. Somebody sent it through to me. I didn't really um, quite get it initially until I started to do some research, but I've started it off with the New York Times. Britain's appalling transgender debate. And um, this is focused around Caitlyn Jenner, uh, who's there on screen. Um, the Guardian actually picked up on it as well. Caitlyn Jenner to give diversity talk in House of Commons. Then we get a little bit more flavour to it. And this is returning to where you started, Mike. Transgender activist will deliver Channel 4 lecture, which MPs are invited to attend. So we've got Channel 4 actually driving a diversity political stepping stone, I'm calling it, to transhumanism. They're not talking about transhumanism, but that's where it's going. But it's Channel 4 paying for a massive lobbying exercise inside government. That's what it's to do with. The papers don't report it in that way. Uh, let's have a look at some of the comment. Uh, here we are, MPs are invited to attend the lecture, which has been screened on YouTube in previous years at the Churchill Room in the House of Commons on the 9th of May. And uh, if we add this bit in here, a spokesman for the channel said the aim of the Channel 4 diversity lecture is to raise awareness and stimulate public debate about diversity issues. So we're really dealing with a media outlet, Channel 4, but they get in, they bury their way into um, Westminster and they're helping to form policy. And they say Caitlyn Jenner is one of the most high profile transgender people in the world and her transition brought, sorry, her transition brought transgender issues into the mainstream, helping to stimulate debate and increase awareness. So here we've got this, this tight collaboration between the political agenda, the politicians supposed to be representing the body of the public, but actually we've got them in bed with the big media firms who are doing what? Pushing that, this out as propaganda. Well, Channel 4 in particular, and you have labelled that stepping stone to transhumanism. Well, uh, Channel 4 has been on the cha transhumanism agenda for quite some time now. And uh, if we go back a couple of years, I suggest people have a look uh, online for uh, a video called Prototype by Victoria Modesta. It's a, it's a pop video. Uh, this was sponsored by Channel 4. Uh, and uh, you'll get a very uh, clear picture of where Channel 4 wants to go with this. Right. Um, I'm just going to respond to a comment in the chat box. Somebody has said, is this important? Well, of course, if you say that the political agenda is that uh, our identity as human beings is going to be removed completely. Remember, this is an attack on the gay agenda as, a much, as much as is, it is an attack on heterosexuals. This is a very, very sinister uh, policy which is now coming out of the government which is going to affect all of us and our children. So we'll push it a little bit more because Matt Hancock of course is quoted when you start to look into this. He says uh, the work being done by Channel 4 is a fantastic step in making sure that our film and TV sectors reflect the full diversity of UK society today both in front of and behind the camera. I'm delighted to see Channel 4 building on its 2016 success and congratulate them on their, quote, creative and imaginative approach to improving diversity, which will help inform the, quote, government's industrial strategy. Yeah. So there we are. This is, uh, this is government policy uh, being pushed out with the help of a propaganda machine, propaganda hub, I've called it. And we'll give this quote as well. Um, where are we? But the industry still needs to do more. The creative industries are potentially one of the greatest forces for openness and social mobility we have. And I want to see all broadcasters striving to stamp out diversity barriers and reflect the country they serve. 
I've added in there as we move towards the removal of human sexuality and embrace transhumanism. So there we are. It's uh, quite clear uh, with the media industry and politics, there's no separation of power. And uh, what we've got is a huge um, propaganda hub now working with the government. Um, but it's all right, uh, Brian, because uh, Matt Hancock was in Parliament yesterday uh, maintaining press freedom, uh, so we don't have to worry. There he was. Uh, and, uh, well, as we pointed out on the news programme yesterday, there were two amendments being uh, proposed for the Data Protection Bill, uh, one by Ed Miliband, and actually Ken Clark was, uh, was co-sponsoring that, and that was to uh, push for a second part to the Leveson inquiry. And the other was uh, by Tom Watson, which was uh, trying to uh, invoke the Section 40 of the Crime and Courts Act, uh, which would have seen uh, the media uh, having to pay court costs of both sides of uh, any kind of uh, lawsuit if they hadn't been signed up to the uh, statutory uh, um, regulator. Sorry. Uh, so MPs uh, voted 304 to 295 against carrying out part two of the Leveson inquiry. Uh, and then for the other one, uh, because the Scottish National Party decided to abstain from voting on the Section, vote, Section 40 amendment, uh, then that was dropped, actually. So, so the uh, press, press freedom is maintained, Brian, and we should be uh, extremely excited about that, yes? Um, yes. No, I'm not, I'm right. not, great, not greatly <laughs> excited, Mike. Uh, okay, <laughs> but uh, don't worry, let's move on. Uh, now, uh, press freedom, here's an example, because the press... Uh, are free, in fact, to lie. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, article from Vice News, a perfect example of it, headline is, a former CIA operative was kicked out of Gina Haspel's confirmation hearing for protesting. Uh, now, this took place uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before. Uh, and uh, uh, who are we talking about? Uh, Ray McGovern, uh, who, was, uh, who was a CIA analyst from... Uh, uh, 1963 to 1990. In the 1980s, he chaired the National Intelligence Estimates and prepared uh, the U.S. President's daily briefing. Uh, and, uh, well, Vice News said it, the protester who just got thrown out of Gina Haspel's confirmation hearing used to brief uh, Ronald Reagan every morning. Uh, former CIA operative turned activist Ray McGovern got up at, a Wednesday, at the Wednesday hearing on Capitol Hill and demanded answers from Haspel. Uh, the acting head of the CIA, at Tr President Trump's nominee uh, to replace Mike Pompeo as CIA chief. Uh, while she promised not to create another torture program, she also wouldn't condemn the previous one, including what happened at a CIA black site in the years after 9-11. When McGovern spoke up, at least five Capitol Police officers quickly detained him, warning him to stop resisting and threw him out of the hearing in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, right. So let's just have a look at exactly what did happen and we'll see if that uh, applies to, because they're, they're only giving half a story here, Brian. So let's have a look. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. And in many respects, in many respects, you guys go into secret fighting. Stop resisting. I'm not resisting. Yes, you are. I'm give me your arm. Give me your arm. Give me your arm. It's dislocated, man. Give me your arm. My left arm is Give me your arm. My left arm is dislocated, damn it. Give me your arm. Stop hurting him. I'm trying to understand. My left arm is. Ah! Hold on, hold on. Stop fighting. I'm not fighting. I'm on the ground. And if you let me get my glasses on, I can see what's happening. You're hurting him. You guys are hurting me. Stop hurting him. I'm immobilized. I'm immobilized. You're going to dislocate my shoulder again. And look, would you pick up my glasses before you start? Okay, so there's about another minute of that. Now, just uh, so that everybody understands, Ray McGovern is a 78-year-old man. Uh, it doesn't require five uh, big, burly 30-year-old uh, men to... Uh, to, to throw him to the floor, jump on him, top of him, uh, try to uh, handcuff him behind his back while he says that his left arm is dislocated. Uh, he's uh, been pretty poorly treated there. And, and yeah, this is 
for why Mike because he's dared to criticize what the official line is and of course this treatment is brutal but this is the same treatment that's been handed out in UK to people who've who've uh, complained or spoken out at local authority the council meeting people have gone into the council debate uh, they've uh, produced fact in front of um, those types of uh, panels and they've been ejected by the police in exactly the same way so we see this brutal treatment increasing and what is usually the cause of it or often the cause of it that you dare to criticize the official line of the government so people have got to wake up to this stuff very very quickly because it's now coming in quickly and as you've pointed out the integration with private security firms I mean the treatment is likely to be even more brutal in the future uh, but the point here is Vice News in their article, of course, didn't mention anything of what happened out in the foyer. Uh, he just got kicked out. Well. <laughs> okay, uh, what's BT up to? Well, <clears throat> BT is busy sacking 13,000 people at the moment and it's going to close its London headquarters. Admittedly, they're going to move from a big headquarters to a smaller one. But this is all part of a 1.5 billion cost cutting drive. And I thought we'd flag this up, of course, because a little while ago we had a report that uh, up to 10 million jobs could go in the near future, reasonably near future as a result of the pressures of AI. Um, so BT cutting jobs, all the apparently the useless people, um, I'm being deliberately provocative there, uh, in their headquarters building. Uh, they say they're going to recruit 6,000 new engineers. I wonder where the recruiting base for the new engineers will be so serious job losses a lot of people are going to be very unhappy unable to pay the mortgage uh, let's see what this uh, man had to say the chief executive um, so here he is he said the position of strength uh, the position they're in a position of strength at the moment mike will it enable us to build on the discipline delivery and risk reduction of the last uh, financial year, a period during which we delivered overall in line with our financial and operational commitments whilst addressing many uncertainties. I've added there a PS, we do need to find a bit of cash for the 11.3 billion pension black hole, but that's only a minor problem because we're in a position of strength. Yes. And I always come back to this, if you were running a very small business, possibly as a sole trader, and you had these massive debts technically you'd be running sorry you'd be operating trading whilst insolvent and you carried on you're going to be put in prison but the moment you're into these super companies you more or less make the law up as you go along mm. uh, right now brexit and one of the things that uh, has been uh, at the forefront of my mind when we look at brexit is international trade and the reason is because uh, in david cameron's original the best of both world documents that was the the key focus uh, and so uh, the international trade committee has been looking into what the government has been up to around international trade and brexit uh, and they're particularly concerned about uh, the so-called trade watchdog that the government uh, is wanting to set up so that we can deal with dispute resolution uh, after uh, after we leave the European Union, uh, the Brexit without the exit, uh, because the government uh, needs to set up this uh, new trade remedies authority in order to defend UK businesses against unfair trading practices uh, everywhere else in the world, apparently. Uh, but the international, or sorry, the Commons International Trade Committee has found what they're calling serious concerns about whether this uh, body, this trade remedies authority, will be set up at all. Uh, and it uh, has delivered a report today. Uh, suggesting that in fact the government's not prepared there's no way it's going to be ready on time uh, and in fact it may not be ready at all the report said uh, trade uh, defense investigations are inherently complex involving resource intensive information gathering exercises and mass ca massive calculations collecting and analyzing the required data necessitates a large staff with economic legal competition financial analysis and language expertise uh, witnesses to the uh, inquiry were sceptical about whether the government could resource and train staff to perform these investigations in less than 12 months. But of course, it's not less than 12 months, is it? Because there's a two year transition period uh, under which we will still be part of the single market and the customs union. Uh, so it's only after the next two and a half to three years uh, that, that we need to be concerned about this. Uh, they were told that uh, 
the International Trade Secretary, that's uh, um, Liam Fox, uh, has a significant role in the selection process that could uh, lead to uh, the, body, the new body being what's being described as ideologically stacked, and so it goes on. Uh, the committee chairman said uh, developing an independent trade policy is an inherently complex exercise, whatever the circumstances, the need to establish new trading relationships must be balanced against the requirement for a robust trade defence regime. Now, there was one key phrase out of the report that, that jumped out at me, and it was this. Uh, it said, without a transparent regime, the UK risks having decisions of the, uh, the Trade Regulation Authority being subject to dispute settlement proceedings at the World Trade Organization. And this, for me, has been the key point in the whole discussion about whether the UK would be subject to the rules or to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice or not, because what the UK is attempting to create here is uh, a mirror of TTIP. They are wanting to create a new dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, TTIP failed uh, because of the scale, because it was viewed by campaigners as being a huge overarching trade agreement between a huge overarching uh, uh, supranational uh, body, the EU, and all these other countries. And what the UK is trying to do under the veneer of Brexit is to recreate that infrastructure, but with the UK at the centre in a, a spider's web of individual bilateral trade agreements with a new dispute resolution mechanism in the centre. The people that were campaigning over TTIP need to be paying attention to this, Brian. It's really important. But look, we don't have to worry because the government says setting up a new trade remedies authority is essential to our preparation for the UK's future independent trade policy. We are glad that the International Trade Committee recognises the government's commitment to protecting UK domestic interests from unfair trading practices. We will respond to the report in due course. Uh, we've engaged with the International Trade Committee, including on the structure and senior leadership of the Trade Remedies Authority. We will continue to work with Parliament, business and other stakeholders to establish an effective trade remedies framework by the time the UK leaves the EU. They will do that because that is the key part of the, uh, of the uh, agenda. And I believe that the European Union is fully bought into this, uh, this uh, infrastructure. And we must mention the Commonwealth in that because, of course, the Commonwealth is is a big um, uh, is is the trading basis for this this massive block that is controlled by Britain. Uh, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Okay, well, we'll end uh, with the uh, dear old Auntie Beeb. This was an article that caught my attention, and the more I read it and looked at it and considered it, the more uh, I found that this was a particularly nasty piece of work for the BBC. Here's the title, The Adopted Children Confused by Love. Who are the children? Well, these are all abused children which have, have gone to adoptive homes and these children are confused. They don't really understand things and they can't really understand love. Um, this has all been put together by uh, for the Victoria Derbyshire programme. And this is one of the comments uh, that we'd like to make on it. Um, if you read this article, you pick out that the BBC is not interested at all in how the children have been abused to end up in this confused state. They're not interested in who abused them and they're not interested in how the state covers up the crime. But instead, the BBC focuses on the children's problems, almost that they're to blame. And as a result of the children's problems, they're putting... The, uh, uh, an unfortunate strain on their carers. People need to read this article to understand what I'm trying to say here, but I find this a particularly offensive piece of reporting by the BBC, particularly bearing in mind that the BBC has helped close down every major expose of child abuse from within the system, be it Westminster, within the charities, within the church. It doesn't matter where that abuse has surfaced, the BBC's work to close it down. Or within itself. Or within itself, Mike, absolutely. And uh, if you follow the article through, you'll eventually come on to this uh, gentleman here who was busy boasting on his Twitter page, his Chris Hemmings, uh, that he, he actually has put out the video uh, to assist this program. So here it is. My film for Victoria Live on children with attachment issues who struggle to be loved 
and the plight of their parents who feel unsupported. So he's very really pleased with himself because he's put this video out. I thought I'd actually just um, have a little bit of a conversation with him. So I've posted that onto his Twitter page, but I'd encourage people to read this piece of journalism uh, by the BBC and Victoria Derbyshire. And I would be interested to know whether um, viewers and readers find it as offensive as I do. Uh, we'll just end with a um, request, really. Uh, we're hearing about the so-called Pearl Office, uh, which is located inside the Cabinet Office. And we understand that this secretive office is the office which is carrying out political business interfaced with the, uh, the big corporate interests, particularly the banks. And uh, we've had a little bit of a heads up on this for some time, but it seems to be growing in strength. Uh, so what we've got is the cabinet office representing one level of secrecy for the British government. Inside that is another office, which is loosely called the Pearl Office. And this is where the true policies are being made uh, in conjunction, particularly with vast banking interests. So if there's anybody out there, particularly if you're working at the higher levels of government and you'd like to um, pass the UK column information, obviously you don't have to reveal your name. We're very interested to learn more. But it does seem, Mike, that this is very, very uh, likely is the term I'm going to use and very dangerous because it says that basically traditional democracy through Westminster has gone and we now have a cabal working from a back office. And this was exactly the way that the Behavioural Insights team um, were put in power to use their applied behavioural psychology to help influence our minds so that we would accept government uh, policy without really knowing what was happening. So there we are. If you can help at all with that, that would be excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. If you're not a subscriber for UK Column, please consider taking out a subscription. We can only do what we do with your financial help. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.